Welcome to Bible Translation and Submissions. This, this event is um, sponsored by three of our research centers on the campus. The Global Missions Center, which is directed by Dr. Kennedy, and the Center for New Testament Textual Studies, which is directed by Dr. Warren, and the Baptist Center for Theology and Ministry, which I direct. Depending on the estimates, depending on the sources, there are 180 million to 250 million people on the planet who have no scripture in their heart language. Zero. No creation story, no account of the flood, no songs, no infancy narrative, no life and teaching of Jesus, no cross and resurrection, no letters to the churches, and no account of the victory of the Lamb. No scripture. And so, we're interested in changing that. And this event, this event is designed to educate people about methods of Bible translation and the nature of Bible translation, and also to network with individuals who think or are interested in doing that. And so although this is hosted at a Baptist seminary, um, most of the organizations that are here are not exclusively Baptist. Uh, but this is a Christian effort. This is an effort uh, of the church globally. And so we are uh, honored that these organizations uh, are here, these individuals are here. Uh, every person who who will speak today has a passion for getting people God's word. And so we're, we're honored uh, by their presence. And, and you should have a program in front of you. And so just briefly, I'll mention the individuals. Uh, Mark Walrod is with Canada Institute of Linguistics. And Mike, would you give us away? And he's here with his wife, Verna. Uh, Dave Brun is here from New Tribes Mission, and uh, Grant Lovejoy is here from the International Mission Board, and Brian Harmelin is here from SIL International, Harry Oaks is here from Wycliffe Associates, and Larry Jones is here from the Seed Company, and Chuck White from Spring Harbor University, and uh, from uh, New Orleans Seminary, uh, Dr. Warren. And so, uh, let's give those folks a hand. I don't want to take any more of our time by way of introductions. Uh, so in just a moment, uh, Dr. Warren will speak to us. Our format for the day is please feel free to come and go. Don't feel like you're interrupting things. Some of you have classes that you need to attend or you have appointments. So as you look at the schedule and you think, oh, I, I wish I could hear this person, but I need to leave at some point, feel the freedom to come and go. Uh, as individuals come in throughout the day, we have some seats up front and in the middle. Uh, and so just uh, come in as you need to. And let me open this in a word of prayer. Please join me. Well, God, we are uh, recipients of your grace. You showed us your grace by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to live and die and be raised for our sins and for our justification and that is a demonstration of your grace and we are thankful. God, you showed your grace by inspiring and preserving your word and by superintending its translation into our heart language so that we might hear the gospel and repent and believe in Jesus. But millions of people today have no access to God's Word. And uh, so we ask God that if you would be so inclined that you would use us to get your Word to these precious people. And we ask all of this in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so you have this background. Since 1978, Bill Warren has been a pastor, a professor, or both. From 1983 to 89, he served as a professor and missionary in Columbia. And as a professor with full teaching responsibilities here at the seminary, 
He travels regularly to Spanish-speaking countries to train pastors. Also, he pastors a church, publishes for the church and the academy, and directs the Haggard Center for New Testament Textual Studies. So again, thank you, Dr. Warren. Actually, the Bible and missions, uh, Bible translations, is something that comes very much from the heart of God because God decided to send us a translation about who he is. And we call that translation the word Jesus because we find that the word became flesh. And in John 1.18, he explained himself to us. And that's part of what Bible translations are about, with Jesus, in a sense, being the translation of God to us, where he would come to our level in our heart language, and he would speak to us where we could understand what his word is about. And so I'm delighted to be part of this conference. I, I, I can't speak to some issues, and so realize this part of the presentation will be a little different than some of the others, uh, because my work has not been uh, with those who have no portion of Scripture in their language. And that takes a lot of preparation along the way. It also uh, takes the efforts to finally get a translation into those languages. And then it takes the effort over time to improve those translations. But we live in a luxury set, to where in many ways we are spending time upon time in getting publishing houses translations. And uh, that's a very different issue uh, today in English. And then we're making translations that try to be so much in the language of people that they get outdated so quickly uh, that it's almost uh, amazing to see how quickly one fades and another one comes into its place. So let's think some about more of the background that I have on text variants and translations. And you may or may not know, but we're right at the uh, uh, edge of a very important date in the history of Bible translations and uh, Bible studies itself, because on October 22nd, as far as we can date, uh, 1454. In other words, somewhere around 560 years ago, the Gutenberg Printing Press printed its first document, a 31-line document. And from that time on, it unleashed the possibility of making books, and more specifically Bibles, at a rate and at a price that was unparalleled before. What an amazing shift. What a miracle in producing Bibles to where we go from the earliest complete Bible that we have with Codex Sinaiticus, that cost somewhere around 15 to 20 years worth of wages for the average person. To where I just got through taking copies of the Bible, the complete Bible in Spanish, down to Cuba this past week at $3 a copy. Now folks, that is a difference on Bible publishing. 15 years of wages, $3. What an amazing miracle. And now we're moving to another age, aren't we? Now we are moving to the digital age. And I'm going to see if this likes my video or not. And it doesn't, so I know another way to do it. And we will let you hear it. Ever since people started recording information, there's been a need to duplicate it. Very nice work, Brother Dominic. Thank you. Very nice. Now, I would like 500 more cents. Brother <laughs> <laughs> Dominic, how are you? Did you do a good job for me? The Xerox 9200 duplicating system. How much of you have ever made? Feeds and cycles originals. Has a computerized program that controls the entire system can duplicate, reduce, and assemble a virtually limitless number of complete sets, and does it all at an incredible two pages per second. Here are your sets, Father. The 500 sets you asked for. It's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> and now we move to the digital age, and things are indeed far different today than what they were before. <laughs> And so we now find that we are able to make Bible translations in a way never known before. But the Bible and missions actually have been key components all along the way. In that sense, from the earliest time, as Judaism expanded, 
and became actually a quite evangelistic religion in the uh, centuries before the first century, all the way up until their crisis with the wars with the Romans. Uh, they also were reaching new people in new settings. They were having a lot of God fears start attending their synagogues. And due both to their own people losing their ability with Hebrew, as well as to other people coming in who didn't know Hebrew, they started making translations. And so missions was already propelling the Bible forward even before Christianity got started. Where we see here an image of Codex Sinaiticus. And it started moving forward with Christianity as well where we would see here an image of a Latin translation of the Bible, where we know by somewhere around the first part of the uh, second century, the midpoint of the second century at the latest, Christians are already starting to put some of our New Testament books, the Gospels seem to be some of the first ones they actually translate, and they're starting to put them into other languages because the Gospel is going past the cities. And it's starting to reach into the countryside. And in the countryside, they don't speak Greek. They speak Greek in the cities. And in that sense, we start finding Syriac translations. And we start finding Latin translations. And at least by the early part of the 3rd century, we find Egyptian translations and Coptic languages, various dialects. And as the church expands, it keeps translating the Bible all along the way. No, the Bible and translations have gone hand in hand to where even around the 600s with Venerable Bede, we find some English being put, old English to be sure, into Bible translations in an interlinear fashion to try to get the Bible into the language of the people. And in that sense, the Reformation also is a major time period. And in that time period, we find that they start using Bibles that have more languages than you could ever imagine. As the Reformation says, ad functus, back to the sources. And we find that we're looking upon a group of people who have decided that the translation of the Bible needs to be founded well upon the sources in which it was first written. And that propels us forward into the modern period. Who are now in the missionary period that follows the Reformation, we're going to go back to translating again from the Greek and the Hebrew and not just the Latin Vulgate in the West. And in the East, well, there's some influence, but it's not nearly the same because they've already got their text in Greek and they're slowly using them in Slavic and other languages, but they really don't have the same emphasis on changing it to new translations. But in that sense, we see start seeing the study of the Bible into multiple languages, and it propels the work forward to where we find it going into European languages, to where by about the year 1800, we have 34 major Bible translations that have been completed, but almost all into European languages. And so everybody in Europe can read the Bible in their own language, except for in a few places where perhaps it's prohibited. But the missionary effort has started going past Europe as early as uh, with Cook sailing into some of the Pacific Islands, others going into other places, and pushing the Bible forward into those settings, sometimes with no other possibility except to try to get a small portion of the text into the local languages. For example, we have this single-leaf palm leaf manuscript. And it's actually incantations, but it has some Christian incantations in it. What an amazing item to find in the 17th century, uh, 1700s that they're already starting to put some verses in the local languages. But I think part of what we have to think about on this is what text will they be using? Well, one of the more recent translations before we move to that is actually one right here locally. And it's putting the Bible into the Choctaw Indian language. And what an amazing item to think that right here in our own backyard there was not a complete Bible in the Choctaw Indian language. And we're only a few hours away from where the center of that indigenous group is at. And now that Bible is available. So, in thinking about the Bible and missions, I think part of what we have to look at first is which text will we translate from and why will it matter? Well, it became a pretty standard practice in recent years to use standardized texts like the Biblia Brightus Ducartensium. 
And that becomes the standard even today for that text. And there might be minor changes that happen from here to there, from the Kittle text that some of us used during our school days to this one now. And as we move forward, there will still be some other changes that take place. And we'll see some changes such as a full paragraph added after 1 Samuel chapter 10, at the end of that chapter, to give a fuller explanation of why are they gouging out the eyes, right eyes of those at Jalash Gilead. And we find that actually there's an explanation. They gouged out everybody else's eyes in this paragraph that we now have validated by the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so we've added it into the critical text. And they gouged out everybody else's eyes, and these 7,000 escaped. And so what are you going to do when they decide that they'll surrender? Well, you have to pay the same penalty all the rest have to pay. And you're going to have your eyes gouged out too. Rather gruesome scene, but there will be some changes like this that take place along the way as we look at the text. And so one of the big questions on Bible translation is which text will you translate from? And we've pretty well settled upon a standard Old Testament text. Whatever changes are brought in have to be echoed in the Bible translations. On the New Testament side, it's been settled, but now it's not settled. <laughs> it's been settled because we finally had the coming together of the two most well-known texts at the time of the 70s, the United Bible Society text, as the third edition comes out, and the Nestle Alam text, as the 26th edition comes out, and they finally put the two texts in agreement. And it looks like, well, now we know exactly which text to use for Bible translating. The only problem is that we keep finding more manuscripts. And so even these texts start suffering more and more changes in the most recent editions, where UBS 5, the Greek New Testament by the United Bible Society, is the fifth edition, and the Nestle Alam 28th edition have started reflecting the text changes of a major project that's being undertaken that actually has two sources feeding into the project. The Editio Critica Maior, the major critical edition, and it's pulling in as many of these manuscript finds as we can get a hold of, and we can incorporate into the text. It's building in new methods of analyzing manuscript relationships, and it's coming up with some changes in our text, places where we weren't quite sure which one to print, and now we have a lot more information and a better analysis system to say, you know, I think we should have used the other word here and not the one we had before. Or now there are some changes and there are going to be further changes. Now here's the good news. Some of those are already incorporated into the text. Some will be incorporated in the upcoming editions that will be published actually somewhere by about 2017. We're thinking we'll have the next edition out. I'm part of the International Greek New Testament Project with this part of that effort, along with Munster's effort. And so we bring those together and we build those changes in. Here's the bad news, but we don't think we'll be through with the entire New Testament until 2030. But relatively speaking, we probably will come back to a very, very stable form of the text at that point forward. And the changes aren't dramatic, but they are important. And that's what we have to realize. But that, of course, assumes that people are going to use the two major editions. Because today we actually have more than those two <coughs> major editions. And some decide to go back to earlier editions in Bible translation. Some have decided that for editorial purposes and copyright reasons, they will create their own Greek New Testaments. Like the Society of Biblical Literature's Greek New Testament edited by Michael Holmes. And Tyndall House's, Tregellis' Greek New Testament where they're also starting to make more and more efforts on a full critical text from their settings. And then we have the majority text editions. Which edition will be used for the Bible translations? That's something we have to decide upon before a translation is even started because it can make a difference. Because the variants are seen through the Bible translations and that's what we have to consider. And are they very important? Well, sometimes they're extremely important. Let me just give you an example of why we have to look at the Greek and the Hebrew text and look at the variants. For example, here in Matthew 27, now the accepted Greek text includes the name Jesus Barabbas and not just Barabbas. 
And we've known about this variant for quite some time, and we've known of some of the implications of this variant, but too many of the translations have been slow to bring anything out about it. The fact is, these variants are realities in the manuscript, and they have to be considered. And sometimes we're not totally certain of the original reading, but you have to print something and you have to make a choice. And the choice makes a difference on the meaning of the text like here. Because if this text indeed is Jesus Barabbas, then the choice is being made over which Jesus do you want? Do you want the Jesus who favors an insurrection against Rome? Who favors a this world messiahship that will do anything it can to take power in this world? Or do you want Jesus of Nazareth? who offers an entirely different vision that says we've got to start with people, not with power. That's where the variant makes a difference. And so which text do we translate? On this one, to be sure, the external evidence, the manuscripts that is, overwhelmingly support the idea that it's just Barabbas. But there are enough manuscripts supporting Jesus Barabbas, and there's some church father statements about this that make us rather sure that actually they took out Jesus Barabbas to where no criminal would bear the name of Jesus. And so which text do we print? The, print, the text we think is original, or do we print the text that we think is less offensive? But our job is to translate the text as close to the original as possible. But you know, there's more to be considered than just the variance in the text on the word. And this is where those in Bible translation have to pay attention to facets that we weren't able to always consider before. Such as, how is the segmentation, or if you prefer, punctuation of the text? Where should it be punctuated? And we're in a stage where renewed studies are being made to look at the manuscripts afresh and make sure that we've got the segmentation of the text right. Is the punctuation correct on the text? For example, we have 1 Corinthians 14.33. And in this text, most of you are familiar with the text, and the text actually says, in this place, that for God is a God of peace. And then we have, as in all the churches of the saints, and then we have verse 14. Let the women be silent in the churches. Now, where do you punctuate that text? Should it be, for God is a God of peace? Period. As in all the churches of the saints, let the women be silent in the churches. Or should it be, as in all, uh, for God is a God of peace, as in all the churches of the saints? Period. Let the women be silent in the churches. Mm, that's a lot of exegetical difference. And there is no difference in wording. This is entirely due to where the punctuation of the text should go. And so we have manuscripts, and now studies are being done on these manuscripts. And here is one from the 3rd century. And in this manuscript, we actually find that the division is marked such that it's minor before as in all the churches of the saints, and it's major before... Let the women be silent in the churches. So the punctuation should be, for God is a God of peace, as in all the churches of the saints, period. Let the women be silent in the churches. New sentence. But we've also had a textual variant there, and we've known that probably is the likely punctuation. But there was a movement in the late 1800s that influenced our text. And it influenced it in the direction of wanting this punctuation to be such that the rule about women was universal. Now, I don't care what your theology is about women in ministry. I'm concerned about the Bible translation. And so I'm not going into the other issue, but I want us to get the text right, because then we'll at least know what we ought to interpret. And in this, we actually have a manuscript from the 4th century, our earliest full copy of the Bible, Codex Sinaiticus. And in case you ever wondered, this is the end of verse 33, as in all the churches of the saints, brand new paragraph. There is no punctuation, but there is segmentation in manuscripts. 
And here we find that at that point in the 4th century, the early mid-300s, they thought verse 34 was a brand new paragraph. But you know, it's not just that manuscript. Here's Codex Vaticanus. And in this manuscript, we find a nice line showing that here's the break. We find punctuation at the end of verse 33. And we find definitely this manuscript also says the major break occurs between 33 and 34. But you say, well, that's just two of them. Well, let's go to another one. Let's go to Alexandrinus, a 5th century manuscript. And you actually have a capital letter over in the margin. You have a full break right here. The division comes between 33 and 34. Well, this one you can't hardly see, can you? But this is one where they don't even have 33 and 34 here. They, uh, 34 and 35, they actually move them back to 40. So I'll help you out on that one. And here you would see, yeah, I know, you've got to read Greek on this. As in all the churches of the saints, and then they skip all the way to verse 36. Well, obviously, they think the break comes at the end of 33. But you know, there are other manuscripts, Byzantine, Alexandrian, if you know anything in the background of textual criticism, every textual family we know of in the early manuscripts makes the division there. Even this one, you can see the paragraph marker in the margin right here. You can see the major break right here, minor break here, major break here. As in all the churches of the saints goes with, for God is a God of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So where do we go on Bible translations? Part of what we have to consider is that when we choose a text, first, the text will have a huge influence over the outcome. Secondly, something that I think we have to be aware of is you have to follow not only the text, you have to pay attention to even the segmentation and punctuation of the text. To where when translations are checked, we don't just check if they're faithful on the word translation. We need to check if they're faithful on the segmentation translation. Because that could make a lot of difference on interpretation. So let me give you a few observations from my perspective as a textual critic. We need more people training we can use. Because missions and Bible translation have gone hand in hand ever since, even before Christianity. And they still go hand in hand. You don't reach new people groups for Christ without good translations of the Bible into their languages. And the best translations are not taking English and translating it into their languages. Sooner or later, we've got to get to where we give them the quality that we demand here. And we can't somehow or another say, well, it's good enough for you, but we wouldn't ever stand for it. And so it's a call for more people to get involved in the study of the languages. And not simply because it's some requirement, but because it's a call. It's a call to make sure that we can get the Bible into the languages of as many people as possible in the best way possible, with the best quality possible. It's also a call for awareness of textual criticism. And that doesn't mean everybody ought to be a textual critic, as a brief conversation here mentioned. I don't think that's true. But we've got to have somebody doing some checking from that perspective, just to make sure that we're being as faithful as possible in the translations and even in the segmentations. It's also a call to put some textual notes into the text. And I think that's something that's lacked in a lot of translations, whether they're brand new or whether they're existing languages. And the reason for that is that these translations become almost like icons in Christianity in these groups. And if we don't show that there's at least some acknowledgement of differences in manuscripts, in the future it becomes tremendously problematic to make any changes to that text when we get better information. For example, back in the 80s while we were in Colombia, the Baptist Spanish Publishing House decided to update the Reina Valera, the 1960, the most dominant translation at the time in most of Latin America. And so they came out with the Reina Valera Actualizada, an updated Reina Valera. And they decided they would base this translation on the best Greek 
Hebrew text. I'm going to deal with Greek, Greek text that we had for the New Testament. Which meant that there were some changes in the text from the 1960 edition. And the reactions were so strong against the changes that they withdrew the initial publication and they reinserted texts that we knew were not original texts. Folks, we've got to put some textual notes into our translations because that sets the stage for people to realize there may be some more information and some updates on some questionable areas of the text. And they're not that many. But on the major ones, we ought to at least have a small note or some indication that there is some question because we don't believe in infallible translators. We believe in an infallible text. In that sense, I think there ought to be a call for some notes on the important variants where we will try to understand the text even when it's not original. And part of the reason for this also is that these may be the earliest commentaries we have on that text. And people have a right to access those. And many times the information is not wrong. It's simply not part of the text. For example, there are quite a number of variants that I think are definitely original to the ministry of Jesus. They simply are not part of the gospel text. But it would be wonderful to give people some access to those items as well. So where do we go? Well, missions both promotes the translation of the Bible and it's moved forward by the translation of the Bible. And it's been that way all the way through Christian history. And so if we're not involved in Bible translation and Bible promotion, I think there's a real question about what we're really doing. It doesn't mean everybody ought to be involved in Bible translation, but you ought to be involved in Bible promotion. You ought to be involved in promoting the spread of the Word of God in the best, most, most faithful way possible. And Bible translations become key aspects of Christian life. So we need excellence in the process, which is where the call for training comes in for dedication. I've been to one of the new tribes training settings. It's amazing the level of training that's needed to do a good Bible translation. I remember some friends who had spent 10 years working with a group, putting their language into written language, teaching them how to read it, and I remember the celebration we had when they got the first book of the Bible into the language of that group. What a celebration we had then as the people were able to read the Bible for the first time in their own language. And then I would say translations need to reflect some major textual information, both within it and in the notes included in it. Because Bible translation is too important. It comes from the heart of God. Even as we started, God sent us a translation of who he is in the person of Jesus Christ in a way that we could understand. Surely the model is there for us to give God's word to others in a language they can understand. Thank you. Sense. How will you ward off evil spirits? 
But think about, and I don't think we understand the exorcism stories in the New Testament very well in our culture. And part of the reason is that we just don't have the same background and the same fear factor of evil spirits. We just don't have that. And so who is able to ward off these evil spirits? Well, the Word of God is the most powerful way possible for Christians to ward them off. And so that, that's where the incantations come in. And these have even moved where you have a Christian focus on the hill, to where they feel like the Christian God is able to ward off these evil spirits. So there were actual words that... That you would say to, to keep an evil spirit away. And I'm sure others have stories of where you've seen that in culture. I just don't think our modern Western culture lends itself to that because we have become so naturalistic in our outlook and that we don't have this sense of a spiritual world that's there. Some of that's positive and some of it's very negative. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend to someone who First call of the local churches need to get more involved again on Bible distribution. And, and I'm not talking about just English Bibles, because a lot of our people have 15 Bibles in their homes. Wow. I mean, uh, they don't read them, but they got them. <laughs> uh, that's a different issue about reading them. And I'm not even going to talk about seminary students. Let's tackle it. I mean, no, that's <laughs> no, the issue is. We're in a society of abundance. Yes. And I think the local church needs to capture the vision again of places where they don't have Bibles. Right. And get involved, and even if it's just sending Bibles to some of these places, or helping people who are going to take Bibles. I know in Cuba we can't just send in masses of Bibles. They go not want letters. And they've got a huge shortage of Bibles in time. While we were in Colombia, we sent 100,000 that we printed in Colombia into Cuba. And uh, it was a great international mission board project. Uh, but we can't get enough Bibles into Cuba. I mean, we didn't have the huge responsiveness Cuban Baptists had sometimes. Uh, but we had 200 plus people come to Christ in just a few days of being there. I mean, that's just not unusual. Uh, one of the pastors was at an event, and over about four days, they had over 800 people come to Christ. And they had no Bibles to give these people. And so uh, that's where we need to get more involved in Bible distribution. In our country, is great. But I mean, in our country, we just need to tell our folks, take a few of them you've already got and pass them around. Yeah. I mean, if you're not going to read it, give it to somebody else. <laughs> no, that's not. But we need to get on into other settings where people either can't afford them or don't have access to them, or we can help fund getting a Bible into their life. Uh, to me, it's a renewed call for the church to get more involved. I know one of our projects as a church, and, and it's just one example, is getting Bibles to those with low levels of literacy. And they actually have some translations available now. And most of our efforts have been in prisons. And we actually have a couple in the church, and their role is trying to teach literacy in prison settings. Because if these folks leave a prison and they can't read and write, they're not going to get a good job. And so let's use the Bible to teach them. We've done it all around the world. That's what these mission agencies do. You translate the Bible and you teach literacy by way of that Bible translation. But our churches can get involved. And we need to get them more involved. And I find people get excited about it. How can a Christian not get excited about the Bible? I mean, uh, to me, that, that's a, a tough one not to get some excitement about. Um, in places like Colombia or Cuba, do digital versions help the distribution? Or that even oh, yeah, that's where we're moving to a new age. And that's what is happening in Cuba. You know, we actually took eSword in, but not as an internet, because they don't have internet. We took it in, and, and we had permission to distribute it by way of memory sticks to anybody we could get it to. And so all of a sudden, where you can't take printed Bibles in, now, it assumes they've got computers, and most of them don't. 
but you can at least start spreading it to others. And uh, we have to realize technology is so expensive that it won't be the long-term answer in a lot of these areas. Uh, but it is part of the answer. It won't be the answer. But all of it feeds together as part of the answer. Uh, maybe some of you remember at the uh, Basan conference when they handed out uh, hand-turned tape items, uh, reports, and for playback. It was for playback. And, uh, I mean, that's just amazing. That way, if you didn't have power, you could still use these things. I mean, that is ingenuity. Or you could get it into settings where they had no power at all. And yet, people could listen to it. In this connection, one of the things that's been very encouraging is discovering that now, even in some of the most impoverished parts of the world, people have a cell phone that has... Yeah, a micro SD card, and for maybe a dollar on that, that micro SD card, they can have a whole New Testament or a whole Bible, audio of those uh, scriptures, uh, the stories that have been recorded. Uh, uh, it's just incredible what can go on a very simple, not very, uh, not very expensive uh, cell phone, and uh, that is really <coughs> encouraging breakthrough in distribution. Yeah, that was actually a. Something, it, it, an interesting anecdotal story on that is that uh, I have a cell phone I keep and the dean at the seminary uses it when we're not there in Cuba. And he had loaded a Spanish translation of the Bible onto it. And so I looked at it and uh, apparently it has a Mormon distribution point. And because uh, he had to download the Book of Mormon with it. <laughs> so his cell phone now has a Mormon translation in Spanish with a few idiosyncrasies I noted on it. But at least he's got it on the cell phone. Exactly right. Easy way to get it passed around. And I think we have to realize cell phones can be used for more nowadays than just phone calls. And people may not be able to afford to use them as phones, but they can use them as digital devices. Uh, that, that's a great job. Uh, in many parts of the world, there are people involved in Bible translation at various levels who have a fairly low level, low degree of education and speak English as a second language. Is there a fairly simple introductory book on textual criticism? Uh, not to qualify them as textual critics, but just to give them an introduction, but written in layman's terms that, uh, that they could get a better understanding. Yeah, we actually have a couple of guides that are very brief and uh, general enough to where most anybody could understand them. I'll be glad to get you some info on those. And they're only about uh, 15, 20 pages long. Uh, I'm talking about literally just a guide for basic info. And well, that could be translated in other ones. Exactly, exactly. Is there, is there uh, anyone that you know of that um, translates it for deaf? Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. And they do, I mean, you know, not just for American deaf, but... No, no, it's not just sign language work um, uh, in the sense of signing it, uh, but they actually are Braille copies of the Bible in multiple languages now. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah. Wickham is working on 200 different... Um, languages for It was pretty interesting to see in Cuba this time. They really picked up on both the deaf and the blind <coughs> on some of their church ministers. And they're doing a lot with both groups and increasing it pretty rapidly right now. And so there are new needs that come about with that. Um, speaking of that, the church I minister at um, here in New Orleans is a deaf church. And um, we're partnering with the Cuba puts on tablets and sends out to indigenous people. Um, it has a panel on it for solar charging, and it connects to a satellite so it can update, and everything's in video, as well as um, Bible Is, it's a free app that's um, translated in the sign language ASL. That's good. Just don't try to take the satellite equipment in people. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Gross is still in jail for that. <laughs> Almost five years now. Um, I want to encourage uh, a Sunday school class to read the Bible. Okay. What program that you recommend that they start out with? Because most of them, 
really the only building on the books of the Bible. That's something you just have to work on. But as far as reading, what do you recommend to the start? We're in a luxury setting, and it's actually pretty phenomenal to see all the options that are out there. We even have illustrated condensed items of the Bible available to you. And some of the drawings are ones that uh, some of us, we're at an age where we think, is that from the Bible? <laughs> uh, but it is quite amazing to see what's happening there. And I'm going to see if I can do this without too much problem. But I won't guarantee it. Let's see. And um, should be down around this This will just be a real quick glimpse for you. These are actually we have a Bible translation focus in our Bible museum right now that's just reopened. And, uh, uh, but youth would look at this. Then you get them full and you get them into a better translation. Uh, because this is not sufficient for Bible study folks. But, uh, <laughs> versus nothing. Versus nothing. This will get them into it. And that's the whole point. The best translation is the one that people will read and as far as English. Yeah. <laughs> now, you won't find verses and all. Uh, but, I mean, this at least will get them to start. And so, now, if it's adults, there are some that are, are even better. But I would like to recommend some. And I think our time's about there. Very good.